Okay, we're, we're about close. I'm going to pass out some... Well, I'm not going to pass out. Um, I'm going to talk. <laughs> I'm going to pass out some bookmarks that are about a, a three-day writing seminar that Rebecca and I give with three other international best-selling authors, and we'll be talking. This, the talk that I'm going to give now is also one uh, that I give during that. And we've got two more tomorrow. One is um, Things I Wish a Pro Had Told Me When I Was Starting Out, basically about how to be a professional writer, how to act professional and think like a professional. That's tomorrow at some time listed in your program. Uh, and I'm also doing an 11 tips to increase your writing productivity tomorrow afternoon. So uh, if, you, if you wanted to come to that, those are things that we give at this writing seminar. Um, could I have a lovely Vanna White who would help me pass out these? And afterward, I'm not sure if I got enough of them, but I, if you didn't get, this is a free sample of my Clockwork Angels book with Neil, Neil Peart from Rush. It's a steampunk fantasy based on their new album, and it's the first three chapters. Um, and first, I want to remind you also that this is being recorded, so please laugh at my jokes. <laughs> Okay. I have always wanted to be a writer. And by that I mean I have always wanted to be a writer. Since I was five years old, I made up my mind that this is what I wanted to do. What happened when I was five years old is I saw the movie The War of the Worlds. Why my parents would let a five-year-old kid watch The War of the Worlds, I don't know. But I remember lying awake all that night with those scenes from the movie just pouring through my head with the Martian ships flying back and forth and the heat rays disintegrating buildings. Um, and, and then when they, they got the disease and the ships are crashing and the, the um, ship opens up and this three-fingered hand from the Martian comes crawling out and it's all covered with leprous spots because the Martians didn't have any resistance to Earth to the common cold or to earth diseases. Um, that was just really cool stuff for me. And I, I thought that was something that I, I wanted to do. It caught fire on my imagination. And so the next morning what I did, I took the little uh, notepad from beside the phone, the little scraps of paper, and I drew pictures on it because I didn't know how to write. I was five years old. And I drew pictures of scenes from the movie. I would lay them out along the floor and stop anybody who would come close, and I'd tell them the story of the War of the Worlds, the Martian invasion. So that was like my first experience with graphic novel storytelling. <laughs> I grew up in a very, very small town in Wisconsin, which is our, one of our farming states, very rural. The population was about 200 uh, people. I'm sure none of you here can relate to anything like that. <laughs> The only industry in that town was the sauerkraut factory, which meant all of the farmers in the surrounding lands grew cabbage. And as I was a kid growing up, I watched the trucks filled with cabbage drive back and forth across uh, the, the highway. And the processing plant for the sauerkraut factory would process the cabbage and make sauerkraut out of it. And you can imagine how delightful the smell was. This was Wisconsin, so we had cold winters, and it would snow, and it would be freezing, but the sauerkraut factory would process sauerkraut all, all winter long and dump the waste out into the drainage ditch that would flow down the street and freeze, and then springtime would come along and thaw and rot, and the smell was even better. And you wonder why I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. <laughs> My mom was the sauerkraut queen of Franksville, Wisconsin in 1956, so I grew up in a household with royalty in it. But after the experience with the War of the Worlds and growing up in this little t tiny town, I was hooked on science fiction. But before I could become a writer, I had to become a reader. But my town was so small, it didn't have a library. We had the bookmobile. I don't know if you have that or had that or not, but the bookmobile is basically like a Winnebago filled with books that drove from town to town. And, and once a month, the bookmobile would show up at the bank parking lot and it would park there. 
and they would put the ramp down and you could come with your library card and check out books. And I had a battered old used bike that I would ride down to town with my library card and I checked out the books that they had in the bookmobile. They had a kid section of, of books, which was not very big, just like a shelf of books. So I would check those books out and read them and go back the next day, next time the bookmobile was there and check out some more. And I rapidly went through that shelf of the kids' books. So after I finished reading all of the books in the children's section, my gaze started wandering toward the adult bookstore. I mean, the adult section. <laughs> And I was looking at all these books by Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury. And, and very clearly, I remember that the first book was, that was there that I wanted to read was called The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke. Good old space adventure from the 50s, and it was in the adult section. And you knew that those were good books because they had a little sticker on the spine that had a rocket ship on it. So you knew that those were going to be good. And I took that book, The Sands of Mars, and I had my library card, and I walked up to the front desk of the bookmobile to check it out. Now, I told you that I made up my mind that I wanted to be a writer. So I didn't have any background in, in medical knowledge, in diagnosis, in being a doctor. But even then, I diagnosed that that librarian suffered from persistent hemorrhoids. <laughs> because when I brought that book up to check it out, she looked at me with this scrunched, withered face, and she said, no, you can't check that out. That's for grown-ups only. So I went home without a book that time. I had my library card, but I didn't have a book. And my mom could tell that something was wrong, that you know, I was bummed out. I had ridden my bike all the way down there and came back without a book. She said, what's wrong? Well, the librarian wouldn't let me check out the book. Well, why not? Well, she says it's only for grown-ups. I can't check out the book. So she took me by the arm and put me in the front seat of the car and drove me right back down to the bookmobile and marched me back up inside there. And she went to the hemorrhoid lady librarian. <laughs> and she said, you let him check out any book he wants to check out. This is for, he's reading. You let him check out these books. Now, I don't know how many of you have even read Arthur C. Clarke's The Sands of Mars, but you can't imagine a more innocuous book. I mean, it's a 50s space adventure. They go to Mars and, and they explore it. I mean, there's nothing at all inappropriate in this book. So I got to check out the book, and then I got to keep checking out the adult books with the little rocket ship on the spine. And I also remembered that my parents found an ad in the Parade magazine supplement in the newspaper. I don't know if you have that or not, but it, it's the Sunday newspaper has this little magazine supplement in it. And there was an ad for 100 classics of English literature for $25. It was the Airmont Classics Library of paperback, paperback classics, which was really like the most horrible gray pulp paper with microscopic printing on it. And these were all, I know now, these were all out of copyright books so that the publisher could just reprint them. But these were 100 classics of literature, and, and we didn't have a library. My parents ordered it, and I remember the day that the, the delivery truck came up and the driver came in with these boxes of books. And we spent that afternoon, um, well, my parents and I, not the driver, he didn't stay. <laughs> we opened up the boxes and we were taking out these books. One after another, book after book, and there was Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and A Journey to the Center of the Earth and Frankenstein, and Dracula, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and, and The War of the Worlds was in there. And H.G. Wells' The Time Machine was in there. And crap like Jane Austen and stuff, so we didn't... <laughs> those, those did not go on my to-read shelf at all. I think Mom read those, but... Um, but I, I had, like, Kevin's shelf where I put all of those, those books that were there... And I went through the first, the first grown-up book that I ever read was The Time Machine. And then I read The War of the Worlds, which was different from the movie, but it was still a pretty cool book. 
And I started working my way through all of that. And then I decided that I had some background now, and I, I could become a writer. I had these stories that I wanted to tell. My dad had a, a study or a den in the house, and he had a typewriter in there, an old manual typewriter, and a stack of magenta scratch paper. Why anyone keeps bright pink scratch paper, I don't know, but that's what he had there. And I was a little more than eight years old when I went into his den and I picked up one of those sheets of pink scrap paper and rolled it into the manual typewriter and I wrote my first novel. It was called The Injection and it was three pages long about a mad scientist who invents a formula that will bring anything to life. But the other scientists don't believe him. So he decides to get his revenge, because that's what mad scientists do. <laughs> he goes to the wax museum, and he brings a bunch of the wax figures to life, the, you know, the Frankenstein and werewolf, because it was a cool wax museum that had a bunch of monsters in it. So he brings all these wax figures to life. Then he goes to the Natural History Museum, and he brings a bunch of the dinosaur skeletons to life. And they go on the rampage, because, again, that's what mad scientists do. So he's riding a triceratops skeleton and leading a bunch of other dinosaur skeletons and the wax figures, and they're going into the city. And he made the fundamental mistake um, as he's riding the triceratops skeleton, which, well, I'm, I'm sure you all know this, that triceratops skeletons have a tendency to rear up at inappropriate times. <laughs> And this skeleton happened to rear up when it was right under electrical wires and it electrocuted the mad scientist and the world was saved. <laughs> that was my first novel when I was about eight and a half years old. It's still better than some movies that I've seen recently, but... <laughs> I decided that I really wanted to do this. I had saved up enough money. Uh, I think I was like... 10 years old or so by then, I'd saved up enough money from my allowance and from going along the, the roadside and I would pick up cans and you could return them for five cents a piece. And I got a few odd jobs like pulling weeds in the bank parking lot for five bucks or something like that. And I saved up all my money. And I had enough money that I could either buy my own bicycle like a normal kid or I could buy my own typewriter. And I decided I wanted to be a writer, so I spent all of my money when I was 10 years old to buy a Smith Corona electric typewriter on which I kept writing my stories and kept writing and rewriting the injection so that it became you know, a full-fledged novel. When I got to high school, I, one of the classes I took was a medieval history class. And we had to write a term paper uh, about some, something from the Middle Ages. And I was really interested in the Black Death. That sounds a little strange, but I was really interested in the Black Death, this huge plague that, that struck Europe, the bubonic plague. And we had to do a term paper, but instead of writing the term paper as a paper, I decided to write a short story. And my story was called Blessed Are the Pure in Heart because it's about two boys, twin boys, and one of them gets the plague which manifests itself by having swellings under your armpit and dark spots on your skin. And when the twin boy, when the twin starts to get sick, the father kicks both of them out of the house because they don't want the plague to, he doesn't want to get the plague. So he kicks his sons out of the house. And the brother takes his sick twin throughout this medieval town to try to cure him of the plague takes him first to an apothecary where they try various potions and things of the time, and that doesn't work. The kid just keeps getting sicker. And then he takes him to a magician who works spells and have them go, and all this was research. I mean, this was what they really did during the plague. And then finally, they go to um, the church, and he takes his brother into the church. And his brother liked to listen to the Beatitudes. So he's reading from the family Bible. He's reading, Blessed are the pure in heart. Um, and he reads the Beatitudes to his brother, who then dies in his arms. And then he puts the, the Bible back inside his shirt, up against the swelling that's starting to form under his arm. 
So that was my term paper, and I got an A on it. (laughs) But even better was, my mom read that story. And I remember her reading the story, and she was sitting there going through my manuscript, and it was like, Mom, I got an A, read this. So she was reading the story, and I came up to her, and she was finished. And she had tears. (laughs) And I, I just remember that, and I thought, I did that. I wrote this story that meant so much to somebody that they reacted like that. And that was like really the first time I saw the real power behind this, that when you tell stories, they're not just little fun things. That they are something that, that you can have other people live what's in your imagination. And I thought, this must be a really good story because I got an A on it. And I made my mom cry. And so I sent it into Boys Life magazine and got my very first form rejection letter. (laughs) Oh well, so I sent it out again. And I sent another story out, and I kept writing stories and sent another story out. And finally, when I was a junior in high school, I got my first story published in a Wisconsin high school writings magazine. It was a story called Memorial, and it takes place after a nuclear war when the whole world's devastated and everything's dead and, and, and the cities are blackened and the ground is radioactive. And it's, it's on a seashore with the tide going in and out and in and out and something's drifting on the water. And it's a, like a melted glass bottle drifting in and the, the tide comes and goes and finally the bottle washes up on this barren radioactive beach and it rolls over just enough so that you can see the blackened paint that's on the bottle. And it says, Coke adds life. <laughs> and that was my first published story. I actually sold a story a year later when I was a senior in high school for $11.50. And so I knew that I could make a living out of writing. <laughs> My, my parents weren't necessarily so convinced. but So I went to college, and I was going to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer. But my parents were practical people. My dad was a bank president. My mom was an accountant. And they said, if you're going to go to college, it's, o- it's okay if you want to keep writing stories in the evening and the weekends, and that's your hobby, and we're glad that you're interested in this. But you need to get a degree in something where you can actually make a living, that you need to pay the bills and support yourself. And so being the typical rebellious kid, I said, all right, I won't major in writing. I majored in astronomy and Russian history instead. (laughs) And I kept writing stories um, in the evenings and in weekends and sending them out and getting rejections and sending more out and getting more rejections. and getting some articles published. And I got my degree in, in Russian history, well, in astronom- astronomy and physics and Russian history. And I started applying, for job, started applying for jobs as a technical writer because I had a science background and I wanted to make my living by writing. Even if it wasn't writing novels, it was still making a living by writing. So I applied for a, a job at a large research lab, a scientific research lab out in California they were a nuclear weapons lab. And when I, br- I came in and I met with them, this was during the Cold War. So we were very tense with the Russians. So they look at me and they go, well, you've got a physics and an astronomy degree, so you know the science. And you've got all these writing credits from short stories and articles. And you've even got a minor in Russian history. This is just perfect. So they offered me a job, first interview ever, with a starting salary greater than my dad was making as a bank president. (laughs) And they both said, we knew you could do it. (laughs) (laughs) So I got my job working as a technical writer, and and everybody knew I wanted to be a writer-writer anyway, but I'm working for years there, still submitting things around, and going to writers' conferences like this one. 
And at one of those writers' conferences, I got a trophy. I still have this trophy, and it's in my office. It's a trophy that is very important to me. In fact, I keep it on the toilet tank in the bathroom of my office because it says engraved in the metal plate down on the bottom of the trophy that I am the writer with no future. (laughs) Because I could produce more rejection slips by weight than any other writer at the entire conference. (laughs) So that's how how much standing I put into various awards here and there. So I have that one. I kept sending stories around. I wrote the first book in a fantasy trilogy. Um, I I got an agent who submitted it around. Uh, I was going to write the second book in my fantasy trilogy, but he gave me some very good advice and said, well, if I can't sell the first book, then you're wasting your time writing the second book. So you might as well write something completely different. What I wrote was called Resurrection Inc., and it's a science fiction gothic horror murder mystery. (laughs) Another one of those. And he managed to sell that one. I came back to my office one day at at work, and I found a blinking light on my answering machine. And this was back in the days when you had actual cassette tapes in your answering machine, and uh, the red lights blinking that had a message, so I punched the play button. And it's, hi, Kevin, this is your agent. I've got some good news. I wanted to let you know that I have sold your first novel to Signet Books. It'll be a paperback original, and uh, it was the first editor we submitted it to, and it's a great deal, and, and this is the start of a great career, and mazel tov, and all this stuff. And I did what every normal person would have done. I walked out of the office and down the hall and went, ah, I saw my first novel. So I was screaming and running up in to other offices and telling everybody that I'd sold my novel and gushing about what the terms were and, and where it was going to be published and who was going to do it and who was the editor and office to office. I mean, I was walking on air. This was so thrilling to me. And about halfway around, I realized, you know what? That's just the start of a long career for me because I'm going to be a writer. And this is my first novel sale, and I've got it on cassette tape. My agent recorded this, I've sold your first novel. I better keep that. That's going to be cool. So I run back to my office only to find that somebody had called in and recorded over the message and said that I had a photo order ready to pick up. (laughs) Oh, well. So that editor who bought Resurrection, Inc. then asked my agent, this is really good. What else does he have? And my agent said, Well, he's got this fantasy trilogy. So they looked at the first book, which I had already written, and they liked it, and so they bought the fantasy trilogy. So within like a four-week period, I went from having no novels sold to four novels sold, including two that were not yet written and I needed to get started. (laughs) That was a good month. (laughs) So I'm working on those, and I... um, co-authored some techno thrillers with another writer that that we sold and I continued to do some short stories and I worked with my editors Um, I I revised the books when they asked them to revise them I turned everything in on time like I was supposed to Um, I was easy to work with I delivered what I was you know what I promised I was going to deliver they sold well enough. They were critical successes, which means they got good reviews, but not a lot of people bought them. (laughs) But I worked well with the editors. They all liked it. And I didn't even know that throughout all this, I was auditioning. I got a phone call from my editor at Bantam Books one afternoon, and she said, Kevin, do you like Star Wars? And this was before there were any Star Wars books. And I said, well, sure, everybody likes Star Wars. What do you want? She said, would you like to write three sequels to it? So I thought long and hard for a nanosecond or so. (laughs) And said, sure, I can do that. So I've got a theory about success and how it happens. And it has to do with popcorn. There are a couple of ways that you can make popcorn, and I'm not talking about the the easy microwave cop-out way. I'm talking about the way when you put it on the stove in a pan. You could make popcorn by taking the pot, 
and rinsing it out and wiping it dry so that it's perfectly clean. And then you set it on the burner on your stove, exactly in the center of the, of the burner so that it's evenly um, placed. Then you take a tablespoon and measure out exactly the right amount of oil and you put it in the center of the pan and then you swirl the pan around so that it's evenly distributed. Set the pan back down, again, in the center of the burner. And then you go to your jar of popcorn kernels and you search through it and you select out the right popcorn kernel. It can't just be any popcorn kernel. It's got to be the right popcorn kernel. And if you get the right popcorn kernel, then you put it in the center of the pan and turn on the heat. Not too high. You just want to warm it up a little bit. You turn on the heat, and then when it's warmed up, then you turn up the heat a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and you swirl it around a little so that it it gets evenly distributed again, and the heat rises a little bit, and you see a few bubbles forming in the oil, and you turn up the heat a little bit more, and the time keeps going on, and and you can feel the heat waving off the pan, and the kernel's starting to move a little bit, and you're watching it, and finally you're going, fly, little kernel, fly, and the popcorn pops, and you take that one kernel, and you set it outside in the bowl, and then you go and wash the pan out and dry it so that it's all ready to go for the next kernel, And then you go back to the stove and put it exactly in the center of the burner. That's one way that you can make popcorn. (laughs) You might starve, but it is a way that you can make popcorn. Or you can put oil in the pan. You can put a bunch of kernels into the pan. Turn on the heat. Now, I don't know where any particular kernel is going to pop or when or which direction it's going to fly, but I guarantee you... If you put enough kernels there with enough heat and wait long enough, things are going to start popping. I was putting a lot of popcorn kernels in the pan. When the editor said, do you like Star Wars? Would you like to write three sequels to it? That's how I signed up to do the Jedi Academy trilogy. When I announced that I was doing that to a bunch of my friends, you know, again, running up another hall going, ah. It turned out that I had met an editor at, at, who now worked for Dark Horse Comics at, a, at one of these writers' conferences. And Dark Horse Comics had published some Star Wars comics, and they were going to collect them in a trade paperback collection. And when this friend of mine found out that I was writing Star Wars books, she thought, well, why don't we have Kevin write the introduction to these collected comics? So she called and asked if I would be interested in that, and I said, Comics? Can you send me some? So she sent me all the Star Wars comics that I didn't, hadn't read before. I said, sure, I can write that. I can do that. So I read the comics, found out that they had a whole lot to do with the trilogy that I was planning to write, and I got in touch with the comic writer. And we became good friends. He was plotting another series of Star Wars comics that were set about 4,000 years before the movie, turned out that in my trilogy I was plotting, it had the, one of the bad guys was the ghost of a long dead Dark Lord of the Sith from a long time ago. And we decided that maybe we should write something together, and you know, if my guy died a long time ago, well, 4,000 years is a long time, so why doesn't my guy show up in your comics and we write them together? So we decided to write the Tales of the Jedi comics together. So we're writing the Tales of the Jedi comics, which eventually turned out to be like 24 issues of comics. While I'm plotting the Jedi Academy trilogy, as I had already already done the introduction to the other comics. Then I got a call from the publisher, director of Lucasfilm Licensing, explaining a new project. She said, Kevin, the, the artist Ralph McQuarrie wants to do a big, beautiful coffee table art book. Now, Ralph McQuarrie is the guy who made Star Wars look like Star Wars. He's the artist who designed Darth Vader and C-3PO and the Jawa Sandcrawler and Cloud City. and It looks the way it looks because of Ralph McQuarrie. And he was in his 60s, I think, and, and about ready to retire. And he wanted to do this big, beautiful book to wrap it up. And they needed somebody to write fake National Geographic articles for the Star Wars planets to accompany his artwork. And because the art, I mean, Ralph does these big paintings and some sketches, but mainly big paintings. That wasn't possibly, that wasn't enough to fill up an entire art book. 
And so whoever was going to write this book would have to spend a lot of time up at Skywalker Ranch in the art archives digging through all of the original character sketches, the, the napkins with aliens on them, and the, the paintings that were there for the movies in order to pull out enough artwork to go into this book. And by the way, because Ralph was very good friends with George Lucas, that whoever did this book would also have to meet with George Lucas a couple of times because this was a very important book to him. And Kevin, would you be interested in doing something like that? (laughs) Yes, I can do that. But then reality set in because by this time we knew Timothy Zahn was writing Star Wars books and Dave Wolverton and Kathy Tires and other, other authors. So these other authors are writing Star Wars books, and and why are you calling me? Because, I mean, did they all turn it down, or or what happened? And she said, oh, no, 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 you're just the only author that's within driving distance of Skywalker Ranch. (laughs) So that's how I got that job. So I'm meeting with Ralph McCory once a month, and I'm up at Skywalker Ranch digging through the art archives. And one day I'm, I'm shuffling through the folders and pulling out, you know, napkins with Ewoks on them and things and setting the good ones aside while the publisher of Ban- or the deputy publisher of Bantam Books and the Lucasfilm licensing person are off at, at her desk on a corner of the room and they're discussing various projects as I'm you know, just doing all my stuff and they're talking about how they were thinking about doing Star Wars anthologies, collections of Star Wars short stories but they gave up on the idea because you can't have 20 different writers doing Luke Skywalker stories and stuff because it would mess with the continuity and there's just too much too much involved that would that would complicate things because you can't have the main characters doing all these random stories. So I just looked up and I said, "Oh, well that's not the problem. The easy way to do that is to do like a collection of the the cantina stories. Like everybody who was in that cantina scene, like why does the bartender hate droids and why is Greedo such a bad shot?" And this was when he actually didn't shoot first. Um, <laughs> Um, and then, why, who is this guy who has the death sentence on 12 systems? And, you know, what's their stories? Because they're Star Wars stories, but they're not going to really mess with your continuity because they're all peripheral things. And, and you do a collection of those, and that solves your problem. So I went back. I think I found, like, a picture of unclothed Yoda or something, and I was setting that aside not to be published. And, uh, <laughs> And I realized it was completely silent on the other side of the room. So I looked up, and they're just staring at me. So I said, and I can edit that for you. And they said, you can do that. So that's how I got to edit the Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina. About a week after that, the Lucasfilm person called me up again and said, you know, Kevin, we really like that idea for the anthology that you have. Okay, thank you. She said, no, we really like it. And, and do you think you could do another one too so that we've got two going on? And I said, you know, I thought for a second, and I went, well, we could do the same thing with Jabba the Hutt's palace. I mean, this, the stories of everybody in Jabba's palace. The, who's the guy who keeps the monster in the basement? And who's the green dancing girl? And who, why is there a puffy blue elephant in the band? And <laughs> stuff like that. And she said, that's a great idea. Can you write up something about it, and we'll send it into Bantam and see if they're interested? And I said, yes, I can do that. But I'm writing the Jedi Academy trilogy right now and 24 issues of Tales of the Jedi comic books, and I'm doing this art book with Ralph McQuarrie, and I'm already editing the Moss Eisley Cantina anthology. So I'm a little busy right now. It'll be, you know, it'll be a month or so before I can get around to writing up a whole proposal for this. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. There's no hurry, and, and we're just interested, so get around to it when you can. Two days later, she calls back and says, never mind, don't even write up a proposal. We just called Bantam. They love the idea just on its very idea, so they have bought the anthology, but they want two more, not one more. <laughs> So that's why I'm also edited the Tales of the Bounty Hunters, and those three anthologies are still the best-selling science fiction anthologies of all time. So, 
So I've gotten these, so I'm contacting all of my Star Wars writer friends and all of my other writer friends and trying to get them to write stories for my Star Wars anthologies as I'm writing the comics with Tom Veach and as I'm doing the art book for Ralph McQuarrie and I'm doing the Star Wars Jedi Academy trilogy. Uh, and somewhere along the line there, I also sold my book Dark Saber, which is also in the Star Wars universe. Um, and then, you know, I'm, and I'm actually sometimes I'm finishing these things as well, so they're they're getting through. <laughs> And I met with the Lucasfilm people again because I was up there every month doing stuff. And she, the Lucasfilm person said, we've been thinking. We think that, that maybe there's interest in, in, Star Wars, do you, in Star Wars that there might be some interest in young adult Star Wars. Do you think there's a young adult audience for Star Wars? Have you seen the Ewoks? Uh, I said, yes. She, do you think you could come up with a young adult series for Star Wars? Well, I could, but my wife is actually the young adult writer in the family. Could we work together on it? And they said, sure, you can do that. So they gave us a contract to write three Young Jedi Knights books. We turned in the very first one, and they read it, and called us with a rather odd comment. It was a little surprise in her voice. She said, the Lucasfilm person said, hey, this is good. <laughs> Do six instead of three. Which we wrote those books every three months. Every three months. And when we finished the six, they had us do five more. And when we finished those five, they had us do three more. So it's a total of 14 Young Jedi Knights books. Every one of them, every three months, not a single one late as well as doing the Jedi Academy trilogy and Darksaber and the three anthologies and the art book and the comics, and I was writing my own novels in the middle of all this. And then I got a call from somebody named Chris Carter who had created a show called The X-Files, and he said, Kevin, I love your Star Wars books. Would you write X-Files for me? <laughs> yes, I can do that. <laughs> So that turned into X-Files books. Then I got asked by DC Comics to write some books for them. Uh, I got in touch with the Frank Herbert estate, and I worked with Frank Herbert's son, Brian, to do. We're on our 13th Dune novel right now. Every one of the previous ones has been an uh, international bestseller. Um, I've done tons of my own stuff. I've written this new really cool book with the band Rush, based on their, their album. Um, I've got, let's see, I just turned 50 a couple of months ago. I've published 115 novels. That comes out to 2.3 novels a year, every year since the day I was born. The first few years I wasn't quite as prolific. <laughs> But all of this goes to show how, how one thing leads to another. If I tried to predict any of this stuff that had happened, there is no way I could have said this would lead to this, would lead to this, would lead to this. It was there. I made myself open to the opportunities. I put my, my stuff out there. I did my work. When they offered me a job, I accepted it. And more importantly, when I accepted it, I actually did it. So they asked me again, and more people asked me. And I kept writing, and I absolutely love my job. And so that's how I call it the popcorn theory of success, and how one thing leads to another and things go popping all over the place. So I hope you will also go up, make some popcorn, and have some fun doing your own jobs. Thanks. Now, that's the canned part. I still have about 10 minutes or 7 minutes, so if you have questions, I can... Yes? Kevin, how did you juggle all those projects? Did you write on all of them every day? Did you take a week to do one and then finish that and go to the next? How did you juggle all of them? Um, I have multiple personalities. <laughs> The question is, how did I juggle all those different projects? I have multiple personalities. I, I'm like the guy with the remote control on the TV, just going from channel to channel to channel. Uh, and that's 
one of the techniques I'll be talking about tomorrow about increasing your writing productivity. Uh, but I do a lot of them all at the same time. I somehow manage to, I mean, they're, how, how do you keep your children straight? I mean, they're all in my head. I know who they are. Um, you get mad at the children. Sometimes you can't remember their names right off the top of your head. But, um, but no, they're, they're all, the stories are in my head, and I know the details, and I, I try to work on different things at different stages, but that's how I got them all down. Yes, Michael. So what point into your writing career did you quit your day job? That's a good question. Um, and we talk more about this in our, our detailed professional classes, but writing and publishing is a very, very volatile career that you might sell five books one year and nothing for two years after that. And the money comes in at very random times. Publishers are often late paying when they're supposed to pay. The bank kind of likes it when you pay your house payment on time instead of whenever the next contract payment comes in. So before I quit my day job, we had a full year's expenses in the bank. And my wife kept her job so that we could keep on our benefits. And in the U.S., that's an important thing because health insurance is ridiculous. But um, we didn't, I mean, there are other people who just fly off and, and hope to make a living at it. I kind of like having my house heated and plumbing functional and stuff like that. So we were a little more conservative. But it, I think it was something like seven bestsellers before I quit my day job. Ma'am, you got a question? Same question. Same question. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, do I still get a thrill out of a new one when it when it comes in? Um, some more than others, and the ones that, I've got three books coming out in September, and the one if you come, we have a book signing tomorrow, and I'll, I'll have it there. But if you see the, the, uh, the Rush Clockwork Angels book and take a look at it, it's just a gorgeous book. It's full color all the way throughout, and there's illustrations, and, and the design is so beautiful, and I just, I just want to like hold it close because it's such a cool book. Um, other ones, it's just like a paperback reprint that comes in. It's, oh, it's a reprint, and I'm glad it's out there, and I shelve it somewhere. But still, I love doing this. I can't imagine doing any other job, and I'm still thrilled when everyone everyone comes in. I'm more thrilled when I actually sell it in the first place, but I am thrilled when they get published. So we still got five minutes. Yes, sir. The question is do I prefer writing in my own universe or in like a media tie in universe with somebody else's uh, characters? Uh, and the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I really enjoy writing my own stuff and, and my own creations, but, you know, it's damn cool to be in the Lucasfilm Art Archives and, <laughs> and, and to be making up adventures with Mulder and Scully when X-Files is the number one TV show in the world. And um, I'm a fanboy. I grew up as a fanboy. I've gone to conventions like this since I was uh, uh, 12 years old. And I love being able to... Th I mean, there was a time when I thought the most impressive thing I could ever do was to find some way to contribute something to the Star Trek universe because I was such a Star Trek fan. Well, been there, done that. But, <laughs> but really, still, it is, it is a lot of very neat things, and I enjoy working for other people. But, you know, I like writing my own stuff, too, and it would be great if one of my books were made into a TV series or a movie. And, and you know, any producers out there in the audience? <laughs> Hoping, hoping. So we'll see. Anybody else? Yeah. How much does the, the seminar cost? Um, right now, it's on early bird prices. I think it's seven ninety nine for the three days. It's taught by five international best selling authors. Plus, we're having a guest speaker this year who is an editor at uh, Del Rey, Tor, and Bain Books. We'll probably have a couple of other best selling speakers. Um, the prices they they go up every couple of months um, but we have other people you can talk to Ann in the back because she's been to it before and she'll tell you whether it was really a rip off or not it's awesome <laughs>
but it's it's really designed not for somebody who thinks they might write a story once. That they're it's for serious professional. Do you really want to do this? Here's what you really need to know uh, about contracts and copyright and intellectual property and marketing and promotion and publicity and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, what what I just gave was one of the talks that we give, and then tomorrow the writing productivity. There there are samples of what we give, but it's three days of eight to five plus after hours stuff of hanging out with big best selling authors who tell you to not quit your day job. So. <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh, how does how does co-authoring work? Rather well. Uh, well, we brainstorm the stories together. This is kind of the generic version. We brainstorm the stories together, plot out the entire book. Like when Brian and I plot a Dune book, we'll spend days together just brainstorming and outlining things so that we'll come up with the entire story, start to finish, and break it up into say, 100 chapters, which is about what a Dune book is. And then we split them into he takes 50 chapters and I take 50 chapters. But he takes the 50 chapters he wants to do and I take the 50 chapters that I want to do. And hopefully they're not the same chapters. But he's got strengths and I've got strengths. And if it's like an action space battle chapter, I generally write it. And if it's a philosophical uh, religious chapter, he generally writes it just because of our backgrounds. Then we write our own chapters and exchange them. So he rewrites all of my stuff, and I rewrite all of his stuff. And then we put it all together, and then I go through the whole thing start to finish. Then he goes through the whole thing start to finish uh, online. Not We never do a marked-up manuscript because there's just some personal thing if, if somebody else is making red marks all over your manuscript. So we just do it online, and we never see what the other person changes. And it goes back and forth maybe seven times, eight times until it's polished or until the deadline. And, <laughs> and that's how it goes in. And we both have the same, the same idea in our head. We both check our egos at the door and we turn in the best thing, thing that we possibly can. And since we've now, we're, we have now done 15 700-page books together, I think we've got it figured out. And that's probably all the time that we have. So thank you all very much for listening.